European time. And, um, welcome to the afternoon evening session of, um, of the second day of, um, of the Kutla Fest and, um, and, and the organizers um, have to report and have to come clean on their first and certainly not only blunder in organization. Um, I, I trust you will all have to fill out your um, um, a questionnaire afterwards and you should definitely report that the scheduling had been completely absurd. Um, as uh, Michael Rappaport uh, noted is scheduling this against the semi-final, first semi-finals of the, um, of the Euros, um, completely unacceptable. Now, I have to take full responsibility for this as the others are not Europeans and I should have picked this up and for my apologies, my apologies. And uh, in particular, I would like to take, take this to mention that of course, particular Steve always has been a huge soccer fan. But this is, when I was in Maryland, he told me of the stories when he was watching a TV show Sunday morning on European soccer, maybe the previous week there was something. And, but also in the Euros in 1996, when I was a grad student in Maryland, um, these were pre-internet days or early internet days. There was no nothing we could get this, but we managed to find an obscure Portuguese channel, which we then, uh, which was covering it. And we were able to um, convince, to convince the university library to put this to, to adjust the satellite dishes to get it into the university system. And we put a TV up to watch it. The grad students, of course, we had our priority straight. Uh, and as the tournament progressed, um, word spread within the department and by the quarter or semifinals, we were occupying the colloquium room in the, in the math department in College Park. And then for one semifinal, also it turned out to be that of course, Steve, um, also had his priorities, right? Because he watched the entire match with us, among with quite a few people. We were we probably had the best um, colloquium attendance um, of the entire of the entire semester for this one. So um, again, apologies and uh, Ben. Um, okay. No pressure, but. Um, we, we do want to be back. We will want to be there for the second half. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep that in mind. Thank yeah, you. so it's a great pleasure to, um, to welcome Ben Howard. And he uh, will talk about arithmetic volumes of unitary shimmer varieties. Okay, thank you. Um, so it is, a, it is a pleasure and an honor to speak at this conference uh, for Steve's birthday. Um, when I was a when I was a postdoc, um, Steve really became something like a, a second advisor to me. And um, as I was preparing this talk, I was actually remembering I can pinpoint the exact day and time when that happened, which was when Steve came and gave a seminar talk at the University of Chicago, and he and I went out to lunch at the Medici on 57th Street. And um, I, I expressed interest in his work and asked if, if he could you know, propose some sort of problem that might be a good entry point for someone who didn't, didn't know much about the subject but wanted to learn about it. And I was amazed because he seemed to just sort of drop out conjectures and projects like a gumball machine. Um, I, you know, I thought about doing this, but I never had the time. This always seemed interesting. I couldn't get around to it. Take your pick. And uh, I did and just, chose one that sounded interesting and ran with it and just sort of kept running. Um, so his influence is going to be very obvious in this talk. I'm, uh, I'm trying to win the prize for who can make the most references to results of Steve. So all of this is gonna be a joint work with, with Jan Brunier. Um, before I dive into uh, unitary Shimura varieties, I wanted to go all the way back to the, the simplest case which is just the case of modular curves. So let's start with uh, the moduli stack of elliptic curves, Y. So for me, this is gonna be the, 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 the full integral model. It's a, a smooth deline mumford stack of relative dimension one over spec Z. Um, and if you don't like stacks, you can just replace that with its coarse moduli space and you're not gonna miss a whole lot. And then Y bar is gonna be the, the deline 
graphical word compactification, parameterizing generalized elliptic curves. So if you want, you can just think that that's the projective line. And you won't miss too much. Um, okay, so over the modular curve, of course, there's a universal elliptic curve that I'll call E. And the universal elliptic curve determines a distinguished line bundle on the modular curve. It's the line bundle whose powers, the, whose, the global sections of its powers are modular forms of various weights. Um, so the line bundle of weight one modular forms, you just define by taking the Lie algebra of the universal elliptic curve and taking its dual. Or equivalently, uh, you can take the sheaf of algebraic one forms on E and then just push it forward to the base. And those give you the same line bundle that I'm gonna call omega E over Y. Okay, um, so we've got this distinguished line bundle on the modular curve. And this line bundle comes with a distinguished metric on it, which one could justify calling the, the Hodge metric or the Faultings metric or the Peterson metric. Um, the definition is very simple. So if I give you a complex point on the modular curve that corresponds to some elliptic curve over the complex numbers. And if I take this line bundle and look at its fiber at that point and take a vector in it, SY, well, using this interpretation up here of the line bundle, that vector literally is just a, a global holomorphic one form on the elliptic curve. So you take that holomorphic one form, you wedge it against its complex conjugate to get a form of type 1, 1. You integrate it and then divide by 2 pi i for good luck, take the absolute value, and you declare that to be the length of that vector squared. And so this line bundle with this metric, I'm going to call omega hat E over Y, and it's an element in the in pick hat, the group of isomorphism classes of metrized line bundles on the modular curve. OK. Um, we need to work on the compactification. So this line bundle has a canonical extension to the compactification. Um, you don't want to define it using this definition. You want to focus on this definition as the inverse of the Lie algebra of the universal elliptic curve. So <clears throat> um, using the deline rappaport description of the compactification, you can extend the universal elliptic curve to a smooth group scheme over the compactification, which has, it, over the cusp, it degenerates to a torus. And then once you've got that extension to a smooth group scheme, you can again make the same definition. You just take its Lie algebra, invert it, and that gives you an extension of the line bundle across the cusp. Um, you run into an issue that the metric that I defined does not extend smoothly across the cusp, but uh, its singularity is not too bad. It has what Borgos, Kramer, and Kuhn would call a, a pre-log singularity which basically means this, if, if Q is a local parameter for the cusp and S is some local section that does not vanish at Q equals zero, then the norm of S squared is minus the log absolute value Q squared plus some smooth form. So the metric has a logarithmic singularity of the cusp, which in the grand scheme of things is extremely mild, uh, mild enough that you can kind of ignore it for most practical purposes. And so this, this extension of the line bundle together with the metric that I already defined, defines an element in this generalized borgos kramer kuhn arithmetic Picard group. So my notation here is a little inconsistent. This pick hat of Y really means metrized line bundles on Y. This pick hat means a line bundle on Y bar together with a metric over the interior, which has at worst this kind of logarithmic singularity at the top. Okay. In particular, this mild singularity implies that uh, the churn form of the metric is integrable. So the churn form is defined in the usual way. You define it locally by taking some non-vanishing holomorphic section of the line bundle, take the log of the norm squared, take DDC to that with a minus sign. And it's not only integrable, you can integrate it in the sense that you can actually compute it. And when you integrate the churn form, you get one over 24, which is essentially the value of the Riemann zeta function at minus one. Um, 
the calculation of this integral is by pure thought, okay? So forget about the singularity for the moment. In general, if you're on a compact Riemann surface, you have a metrized line bundle and you integrate its churn form, you just recover the degree of the line bundle. The same thing is true if you allow these very mild singularities. So really all I'm claiming here is that the line bundle of weight one modular forms has degree one over 24, which is a fraction because of stacky reasons. You have to interpret this integral in some orbifold sense where you cover the orbifold by an honest complex manifold and then integrate there and then divide by the degree of the cover. Um, but the pure thought argument for the one over 24 is the following. So take the line bundle of weight one modular forms, take its 12th power. It has a distinguished section, which is Ramanujan's discriminant function, which uh, is a modular form with a single simple zero at the cusp, which is telling you that the, the line bundle of weight 12 modular forms has degree one, and so the line bundle of weight one modular form should have degree one twelfth. And we're off by a factor of two. And the factor of two is just some purely stacky thing. The factor of two um, is just because two is the size of the automorphism group of the universal elliptic curve. So you end up with a one over 24. So that's the proof. Okay. Um, but that's just a statement about the complex fiber. When you integrate the churn form, we can do more. So the, the whole machinery of arithmetic intersection theory. Um, ben, may I ask a small, a small question? Sure. This factor of two is also, uh, it also appears because the natural group acting on Y is PSL2Z, but when, once you include the, the, the elliptic curves themselves, the natural group is SL2Z, and this plus minus one is what contributes in the stacky sense to the to this factor of two or one half? Yeah, that's exactly what I said, because that plus or minus one is the automorphism group of the, I mean, it's exactly the same. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. okay. Because the thanks. plus or minus one acts trivially on the upper half. Right, thanks. Not on the universal elliptic curve. Okay, um, right. So arithmetic intersection theory, um, after Arakelov and Gillet and Soule and Burgos kramer kuhn gives us the following data. So there's an arithmetic churn class that goes from this Borgos kramer kuhn uh, arithmetic Picard group to the co-dimension one arithmetic Chow group, which is just defined as you, you take divisors on Y bar endowed with a green function, modulo some notion of rational equivalence. And the, the arithmetic churn class map is very easy to describe. You take a metrized line bundle pick any rational section of it, and you send it to the arithmetic divisor whose underlying honest divisor is the divisor of the section. And the green function for that divisor is just minus the log of the norm squared of the section that you chose. Um, there is an arithmetic intersection pairing into the co-dimension two arithmetic Chow group. Um, which is, is just, I mean, the, the co-dimension two cycles endowed with a um, a green current, which is somehow too fancy because a co-dimension two cycle on Y bar is a, it's a zero cycle. So it's supported in um, non-zero characteristics. So what does it even mean to give a green current for this? Well, it, it has no complex points, this, this co-dimension two cycle. So a green current, you can, you can take um, any um, smooth one, one form on the complex points of Y bar and that would give you a green current. And then there is an arithmetic degree from the co-dimension two Chow group to R, which is if your uh, class in the co-dimension two Chow group is represented by some zero cycle together with some smooth one one form in the complex fiber, you just send it to kind of the, the degree more or less in the naive sense of the zero cycle uh, plus the integral of that one one form, probably with a one half in front for good luck. And so with all this fancy machinery, you can then attach a number to the modular curve. You just take this metrized line bundle, you intersect it with itself to get into the co-dimension two arithmetic child group. You take its arithmetic degree and we call that the arithmetic volume of the metrized line bundle. And so the obvious question is, 
what is this number? So there it is. There's this very beautiful theorem due independently to Boston Kuhn around 2000, which says that um, this arithmetic volume is essentially the logarithmic derivative of the Riemann zeta function at minus one, up to some little factors like this one that we already said was one over 24, something explicit. Which is great. And as soon as you write down this formula, um, you, you realize that you can ask the same question on almost any Shimura variety. Uh, anything of PEL type or even Hodge type, any place, any Shimura variety that has something that looks like something like a universal abelian scheme over it. Um, you, you define a line bundle in essentially the same way. You take the universal object, you take its Lie algebra, dualize it and take the top exterior power. Or equivalently, uh, you can look at the sheaf of top degree algebraic differential forms and push it down to the base. And then this line bundle has a metric, which is defined in exactly the same way as before using um, this interpretation in terms of algebraic forms. The, the sections of this are just top degree holomorphic forms on the fibers. You wedge them with their complex conjugates and integrate. The catch is that uh, it turns out to be very difficult to compute these arithmetic volumes once you get beyond the modular curve case. And um, there's kind of a, a simple way to explain why it's hard, which is to explain a little bit about the, the proof of Boston Kuhn, um, or at least the proof of Kuhn. Boss proof, I think, was never published, so I'm not exactly sure what his proof was. But what do they do? I mean, we've already said it's, it's enough to replace the line bundle of modular forms um, by its 12th power and compute the volume of that. But when you take the 12th power, Again, you have this canonical global section, Hermanogen's discriminant, which um, has, has on the interior of the modular curve has no zeros or poles, and that's true even on the integral model. So, so Hermanogen's discriminant actually trivializes the line bundle of weight 12 modular forms, which means we're really computing the volume of the trivial bundle, but with a very non-trivial metric on it. When you trivialize it using the discriminant, the metric becomes essentially the log of the absolute value of Ramanujan's discriminant, which is an interesting function on the modular curve. Um, but all of the interesting stuff is then shifted to the complex fiber. And so all of the business about integral models and arithmetic intersection theory, um, it's, it's, it's pleasing to state the theorem that way, but when you actually get down to the proof, this is really just a question about Ramanujan's discriminant, which um, Kuhn reduces to uh, the Kronecker limit formula which relates the, the log of the absolute value of the discriminant to a certain Eisenstein series. And then the zeta function occurs in the Q expansion of this Eisenstein series, and this kind of falls out. Um, as soon as you leave the modular curve, there's no obvious analog of Ramanujan's discriminant, and you're just stuck right off the bat. Nevertheless, there has been progress. So. The case of quaternionic Shimura curves was done by Kudla, Rappaport, and Yang uh, in their marvelous book. Um, the case of Hilbert modular surfaces was done by Brunier, Borges, and Kuhn. And uh, the Siegel threefold was done by Jung and Van Tepich. And then you, you look at this and you think, well, okay, I mean, maybe the main obstacle has been overcome. We've got all of these low dimensional cases, maybe it's only a matter of time before all Shimura varieties fall. Um, but that's a bit too optimistic. Um, when you notice that this is secretly an orthogonal Shimura variety of signature 1, 2. This one is secretly an orthogonal Shimura variety of signature 2, 2. This one is secretly an orthogonal Shimura variety of signature 3, 2. And then you start to think that maybe this is only accessible um, because these happen to lie in this special family. Um, the general case of orthogonal Shimura varieties was done by Fritz Hermann. Um, so essentially, the, this proof and this proof are related. Um, Brunier, Borgos, and Kuhn, when they did Hilbert modular surfaces, in the end, they reduced the case of modular curves by using the fact that you can embed modular curves into Hilbert modular surfaces in lots of different ways uh, via the um, to Brooks-Zaghi divisors. So they gave some sort of inductive argument that gave them this volume in terms of this volume. 
And then Harman sort of took that inductive argument and pushed it to its extreme to all dimensions. Okay. But we can basically do one more case, which is unitary Shimura varieties of signature n minus one one. So, okay, so now the real talk starts. So let K be a quadratic imaginary field of odd discriminant minus D. And M n minus one one, at least it's complex points for the moment, is going to be um, the moduli space parametrizing abelian varieties of dimension n together with an action of the ring of integers of K, such that um, the action of OK on the Lie algebra, when you diagonalize it, an, an element X in OK acts as X, 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 N minus one times, and then one X bar. That's the N minus one comma one. Um, in particular, uh, an equivalent way of stating that, which will be relevant in a moment, Another way of stating this, this signature condition is that there exists a unique hyperplane in the Lie algebra that's stable under the OK action. And on the hyperplane, OK acts via the fixed embedding into the complex numbers, but on the quotient, it acts by the conjugate embedding. And then we want our abelian variety to be endowed with a principal polarization, which is in some sense compatible with the OK action in a way that I wrote here. Okay. Uh, next, there's a good theory of integral models for these things due to Pappas and Nicole Kramer. So there's a flat regular integral model of dimension n over the ring of integers. And that integral model, in fact, has a canonical toroidal compactification um, after, for example, the thesis of Kaiwen Lamb. And it's regular and it's smooth after you invert the discriminant of the quadratic imaginary. And um, to define the integral model, you just extend the moduli problem from the complex numbers to any OK scheme, and you extend it in this way. The moduli space parametrizes abelian varieties of dimension n with an OK action, a principal polarization exactly as above. And now the signature condition is encoded by a choice of hyperplane satisfying the same signature condition on the previous slide. Um, the only difference is that at the primes of bad reduction, at the primes dividing D, this hyperplane is no longer unique. So it's really an important part of the modular problem. And in particular, with this hyperplane built into the moduli problem, over this moduli space, we actually now get uh, two distinguished line bundles. One is the one that we already knew about. You take the dual Lie algebra of the universal object with its top exterior power. But because the Lie algebra now has this distinguished hyperplane floating around because of the moduli problem, you can just take the quotient and that gives you a different line bundle. And in some of what follows, uh, we're gonna have to switch back and forth between these two line bundles. I will explain soon how they are related. Um, okay, this moduli problem is not quite literally a Shimura variety. It decomposes as a disjoint union of Shimura varieties. So the disjoint union is taken over all K Hermitian spaces of signature N minus one, one that admit a self-dual lattice because we impose this principal polarization condition. Um, and each of these pieces, the MVs indexed by these Vs, each one is an honest GUV Shimura variety. And there's some notion of similarity um, that you have to mod out by. And all I wanna point out is that the notion of similarity is kind of uh, there's a uniform way of defining it, but in practice, it looks different depending on whether n is even or odd. And so in some of the later formulas, you're gonna see there's cases whether n is even or odd. And this is sort of the reason why you have these different cases. But now let's fix one of these Vs. And so fix one of these MVs and then take the universal object here, restrict it down to MV and we've got this metrized line bundle, completely analogous to the thing we had for the modular and we can try and compute its arithmetic volume. Here it is. So <clears throat> I put everything down just because I want to convince you that we did everything. There are, there are no error terms. There are no fudge factors swept under the rug. This is the full, the full formula, but most of it is not important. So here's what's important. Um, epsilon is gonna be this quadratic Dirichlet character determined by our quadratic imaginary field. And these functions, beta k's, so k runs between one and n, 
beta k is really just this Dirichlet L function shifted depending on k. And depending on whether k is even or odd, it's either the Dirichlet L function for epsilon or it's the Riemann zeta function. And then this beta k is supposed to remember which particular permission space we're working with. And that just goes into these little corrections to the Euler factors. So you modify the Euler factors depending on the local invariance of the Hermitian space where the local invariant is defined in the usual way as the Hilbert symbol at L of the determinant of V against minus D. And now here's the theorem. Okay, you can take the top exterior power of the churn form of this metrized line bundle, integrate it, and you get a product of L values. Okay. So it's just L values at one, two, three, four, five, up to N, and the values alternate between the, the L function for the quadratic character and the Riemann zeta function. So that's the easy one, easier one. And then the harder one is the arithmetic volume, which is given by the same stuff, except you take the logarithmic derivative of the whole thing. Okay. So this sum of logarithmic derivatives at zero, there's a correction factor of log D, there's this funny term, n times c0 of n, where c0 of n is a slightly unnatural looking expression, but uh, some of you may recognize this as being essentially the faultings height of an elliptic curve with cm by ok. And the reason this correction factor occurs is because this is not quite the right metrized line bundle to look at. We're going to see that most of the hard work is actually going to be done with this line bundle. And if you compute the arithmetic volume of this line bundle instead, you'd get the same formula, but without this sort of annoying term that you don't really want to do. And then finally times the integral of the term form. So that's the theorem, completely explicit. So uh, Ben, so uh, it, uh, it, the answer, I mean, it looks like it's a constant term of the isosan series. Uh... Yeah, I'll get to that at the very end of the talk. Yes, this should be the constant term of an right. Eisenstein series on a quasi-split unitary group. Yes. Yeah, but it's also the same as the RT motive uh, defined by Dick, right? For the for the yeah, group. Dick unit. pointed out to me in an email. That's correct. This is the L function of a unitary group. And and the same thing was true for the result you mentioned earlier for orthogonal group. Uh, um, result so for the, you, by Her Herman, right? Or, right. Um, presumably. It has the same form. It's the same, uh, it, it, the same general shape. It's just in here, the, um, this quadratic character would be the one determined by. Um, you know, there'd only be one term with the quadratic character if the space was even dimensional and had a non-trivial discriminant. Wait, sorry, what? It, you'd be a product of zeta values up to the last one, which could be an L function of a quadratic character if you had an even dimensional space oh. with a non-trivial discriminant. That's not what Herman gets, I believe. Okay, well, so be it. So what that means, I don't know. I have no idea why something like this should be true, really. I just know that we can compute it. You want, you want the telescopic view, you gotta ask somebody else. This is the microscopic view. <laughs> okay, sketch of the proof. So here we go. Uh, the proof is by induction on the dimension. So I should say the, the proof follows the same general structure as Horman's proof for orthogonal groups. The main difference is that when you deal with these unitary Shimura varieties at the, at the primes dividing the discriminant, these things have bad reduction of a kind that just doesn't appear in Horman's case. So all of the hard work is at the primes of bad reduction. And so all of the formulas, every theorem that I state from now on um, is going to be whether I say so or not, up to some kind of error terms at the primes of bad reduction, which one has to explicitly compute and keep track of. That's really where most of the hard work is. Okay, the inductive proof. We start with signature one, one. And in this case, you exploit the fact that there's an isomorphism of real Lie groups, SU11 and SL2R. So in signature one, one, these unitary Shimura curves are really secretly just quaternionic Shimura curves again, um, or modular curves. And we know the arithmetic volumes by the work of Bost, Kuhn, and Fidler Rappaport Yang. Um, just to say something, I mean, it's, it's not quite that simple. You, you have to match up one of these quaternionic Shimura curves with a unitary Shimura curve. 
um, if, if you want them to match up on the level of integral models, you have to directly relate the moduli problems. And when you do this, what you find is that the curves themselves are isomorphic, but each one of the curves has a universal abelian surface over it. When you identify the curves, the abelian surfaces are not quite isomorphic. They're only isogenous. And so each one of these abelian surfaces defines its own metrized line bundle, but they're not the same metrized line bundle. And you have to figure out exactly how they differ. And then you use the calculation of the volume in the quaternionic case to figure out what the volume is for the other one that comes from the unitary side. So there is some work to do, but let's move on. Um, whoop, here we go. Here we are. Okay. So now a funny step. Um, we're going to replace the unitary Shimura variety by a certain finite atoll cover, which is pretty harmless. So all we're going to do is cross it with the moduli space of elliptic curves of CM by OK. Um, you shouldn't think of this as adding level structure to this. You should think of switching to a Shimura variety for a different group. Namely, you can think of this peculiar product space as the Shimura variety associated with the group G parameterizing pairs of an element in a unit in K and an element in the group of unitary similitudes of V, such that the similitude character of G is the norm of the element in K cross. And the reason for doing that, one reason for doing that, is that we, we ultimately want to invoke the theory of Borchard's products from, from the world of orthogonal Shimura varieties. And these Shimura varieties that we're working with, annoyingly, are GU Shimura varieties instead of U Shimura varieties. So the point of this is really just to get rid of the U, because you can kill the similitude factor in G just by rescaling it by alpha inverse, and that gives you a map to the unitary Shimura variety, which then maps to an orthogonal Shimura variety, where the quadratic space is the same as the Hermitian space. The quadratic form is Q of V equals H V V. So the point is that unlike MV, this particular cover admits a map to an orthogonal Shimura variety. And so I'm going to, uh, from now on, my MV really just means this product. So now MV parameterizes pairs consisting of a CM elliptic curve and an abelian variety of higher dimension with an action of OK. Let me ask a terminological question. Sure. You said that the orthogonal groups have a, have a theory of Borchardt's products, yeah. but doesn't this map give you a theory of Borchardt's products on the unitary groups? Yeah, and that's what, exactly what we're going to use. You can pull them back from the so that's so, so then they all have a theory in that sense. Well, yeah. That's so, all. I mean, anything that embeds into an orthogonal Shimura variety, you can say has a theory of Borchardt's products because you can pull them back. Sure. Yeah. They're harder to, I mean, this sort of works on the complex fiber, but then the Borchardt's product gets harder to analyze here because here, um, you, you have cusps that I, there's not really a term for it, where I mean, you have sort of purely correct degeneration, where you, you have a theory of Q expansions as opposed to Fourier Jacobi expansions. And so here you can use the Q expansion to understand the arithmetic of the Borchardt's product. Um, but here it's more complicated because you only have Fourier Jacobi expansions. So it's more difficult to analyze them. Okay, um, once you pass to this cover, uh, you have this universal pair of an elliptic curve and an abelian variety, and that determines a new line bundle where we saw this one before. Inside the Lie algebra of the A, you have this universal hyperplane. You mod out by it to get a line bundle, and then you twist it by the Lie algebra of the universal elliptic curve. And um, you can put a, a metric on this um, in a way that I won't describe, but the reason for working with this, this particular line bundle is that, at least over the complex fiber, that line bundle is actually pulled back from the orthogonal Shimura variety. And it's powers of this line bundle where the Borchardt's products live. <clears throat> and when I said that um, back in the main theorem, there was some unwanted error term, but if you switch to a slightly better line bundle, you'd get rid of it. This is the slightly better line bundle. This is probably the more natural thing to look at from the very beginning, just a little more difficult to describe. But the good news is they are essentially the same. Um, up to the ways in which they differ, which is some, some vertical divisors at the bad primes, which you have to work out explicitly. You have to shift the metrics, which is not so bad. And then um, if that's all you had to do, it would be easy to prove this. But in fact, even after you take into account the right vertical corrections and shift the metric, you're still left with some error term, 
that is not the trivial bundle with the trivial metric. But you have to argue that it is numerically trivial in the sense that its arithmetic intersection uh, with anything of complementary codimension will always give you zero. So for the purposes of any calculation that results in a number, you can ignore this last error and just pretend that these are the same up to some error correction terms that one has to keep track of. And maybe since he's in the audience, I should point out that the fact that this um, extra error term is numerically equivalent to zero, um, this, the, the basic idea for this proof actually comes from um, maybe the, the first paper that Dick Gross ever published where he gave a, a new proof of the chalice selberg formula um, by studying um, unitary Shimura varieties. Okay, now the Borchard's product. So um, there are lots of Borchard's products. They depend on some auxiliary choice. The auxiliary choice is a weakly holomorphic form, f of tau. So this notation here, so I want a, a modular form of typically negative weight that is allowed to have a pole but only at one cusp, the cusp at infinity, and nowhere else. Um, so assume that its Q expansion has integer coefficients, which you can always choose such a form. And then for any such input form, you can construct the Borchard's product that I'll call psi of f, which is a rational section of a particular power of this line bundle that we are working with. And the particular power of the line bundle is essentially uh, C of zero, the constant term of this weakly modular form. And the most important property for us of this Borchard's product is that its divisor is known completely explicitly. So um, it was calculated uh, by Borchard's in the complex fiber as a, a special linear combination of the Z of M's, which are the kudla rappaport divisors that appeared in Way's talk already. And the coefficients on the divisors come from the polar part of this modular form, the negative coefficients. Um, so in the complex fiber of the open unitary Shimura variety, this, is, this equality is exact. Uh, in a paper with Grunier, Kudler, Rappaport, and Yang, we computed the divisor on the whole integral model. And it's a bit of a mess. So there are some, uh, there are some components of the boundary of the toroidal compactification. And there's a whole bunch of vertical components at the primes of bad reduction that, that one has to work out. But we did it, and I'm not going to tell you what the vertical correction terms are, except it's something explicit that one has to keep track of throughout everything that I'm going to say. <clears throat> um, these kudler rappaport divisors, so they're, they're defined on the next slide. Um, in some sense, the definition is not that important to us. What, all you really need to know is that morally, these come from taking smaller unitary Shimura varieties and embedding them in different ways as divisors on the Shimura variety that we're working, working on. Um, the exact definition is written here. Um, maybe I'll say it since it says things that Wei didn't say. Uh, remember that we've replaced our unit, unitary Shimura variety by this cover. So now we have uh, it parameterizes an elliptic curve together with an abelian variety of higher dimension. You can attach to that an OK module, all maps from E into A, and endow it with a positive definite permission form defined in the following way. So A has a principal polarization by definition of the moduli problem. E has a principal polarization because it's an elliptic curve. So if I have two maps from E to A, I can, take, I can go from E to A and then take the dual map in the other direction to end up back at E. That's in, the composition is OK linear, and so it's given by some multiplication by some element in OK. And that defines the permission form. And then this ZM is just the moduli space of such pairs EA together with a map from E to A of permission norm M. It's supposed to look like the coefficient of a theta series. It counts vectors of a given norm in a Hermitian lattice. Now, right, so I said that morally, these things are supposed to look like unitary Shimura varieties of dimension one lower embedded into our unitary Shimura variety. Having now given a precise definition that doesn't obviously look like what I just said, we now have to explain in which case you can make it kind of precise that these divisors really are more or less unitary Shimura varieties of lower dimension. Okay. 
So I don't know how to do that in general. But suppose you just look at the Z of P, where P is a prime congruent to one mod D. In that case, uh, we know pretty explicitly how to relate this to a Shimura variety of lower dimension. You take the Hermitian space in one dimension lower, so signature n minus two one, with the same local invariance as the one that you started with. So that uniquely determines a Hermitian space in one dimension lower. It has its own unitary Shimura variety. And <clears throat> I claim that this Z of P kind of looks like take this thing and embed it into M of V in this many different ways, which is a little bit imprecise, um, but I'll make it more precise in a moment. Um, and you can do this in such a way that if you take the, this metrized line bundle that we're looking at on omega V and restrict it to any one of these P to the N minus one plus one copies of the smaller Shimura variety, this smaller Shimura variety has its own metrized line bundle defined in the verbatim the same way. And when you restrict the one here to each one of these copies, you get the one that already lives on the, the smaller copy. Now, what do these quotes mean? In what sense are we taking P to the N minus one plus one copies of MV prime? Um, so maybe I'll just say it instead of reading you this. Uh, well, maybe I'll just say it. So first of all, this P congruent to one mod D implies that P is split in K. So split it into a, a script P and a script P bar. And um, we want to avoid these bad vertical components. I mean, you have to keep track of them and work them out eventually, but for the moment, for, for, get rid of them by just inverting P times D on the base. Now, this Z of P classifies triples E, A, X, where X is a map from E to A. And you can decompose that into a disjoint union of three pieces, depending on what the kernel of X is. And there are only three possibilities. The kernel of X, given, given that the Hermitian norm of X is P, there are only three possibilities. The kernel could be the script P torsion in E, it could be the P bar torsion in E, or X could be injective. And what I claim is that these first two pieces are nice. Each one of them is dead on isomorphic to this unitary Shimura variety in lower dimension after inverting P and D on the base. So that's two copies of MV prime. And then this last one, well, it maps to MV prime and it's a finite tile cover of degree P to the N minus one, minus one. So in total, you get P to the N minus one plus one copies. So that's what these, this equality in quotes means is this, up to the arrows. Okay. Uh, this is an explanation of how you get these isomorphisms and maps. Probably no one wants to see that. Let's not do that. Okay. So now we have these Borchard's products whose divisors we know how to explicitly relate to Shimura varieties in one dimension lower. Now the Borchard's product depends on this auxiliary choice of weakly holomorphic modular form. This um, space of input forms is infinite dimensional. So we have a lot of choices for how we construct the Borchardt's product. And I'm going to pretend that we can choose this input form in an especially simple way. Namely, I'm going to assume that its polar part just has one term, q to the minus p, where p is congruent to one mod d and is prime. Um, this is probably not possible to do, but you can always choose a form whose polar part is supported on primes like that. So let, just to make life easy, let's just, just pretend we can choose it that way. And then in general, you have to take linear combinations and things that look like that. In particular, the divisor of the Porter's product is now just this one kudler rappaport divisor, which we understand very well by the previous slide, up to some error terms. All right. Right, so, so all of this now is uh, arithmetic geometry, but at some point somewhere, if we're ever gonna prove this theorem that was stated all the way back here, some L functions have to appear. How do we get L functions into this? This, I probably can't explain why, but this is probably my favorite part of the proof, despite the fact that it's extremely simple. Um, it turns out that whenever you have one of these weakly holomorphic forms, if you know the polar part, 
you also know the constant time. And so if we start with a form with this very, very simple polar part, we must get some very simple form for the constant term as well. And here it is. I claim the constant term is essentially the reciprocal of one of these L values that's supposed to appear in the theorem. And uh, the proof of this is very easy. So you consider the Eisenstein series of weight n that vanishes for, for level gamma zero d that vanishes at every cusp except the cusp at infinity. Then uh, remember our input form had weight two minus n. So you take the input form, you multiply it by the Eisenstein series, you get a weakly holomorphic form of weight two. You put a d tau next to it, and now you have a holomorphic one form on the open modular curve whose only pole is at infinity. And so by the residue theorem, the residue at infinity must be zero. But you can read off the residue of this form at infinity just by looking at the Q expansions of F and E. And this is the general formula. You just sum over M greater than or equal to zero of this, the minus M coefficient of F and the M coefficient of E. But because our F, the only negative coefficients with this one prime and the coefficient is one, the only terms that contribute are uh, M equals P where we just get the coefficient of the Eisenstein series and M equals one where we just get the constant term of F because our Eisenstein series is constant. And so in fact, the constant term of our input form is just minus the pth coefficient of the Eisenstein series, which is something that you can look up in any reference on modular forms. So we found it in Miyake's book and here it is, it's exactly this. So the point here is that we're sneaking the L value into the problem by hiding it here in the weight of the Borchardt's product. That's where there's secretly an L value. Okay, so far so good? Because I'm about to prove part one of the theorem. Okay, here we go. Um, so forget about the, I mean, now we're just in the, in the complex fiber now. There's no, no integral models, no arithmetic stuff. The, um, the usual Chow group in co-dimension one is just the Picard group. And what is that isomorphism? You, you take a line bundle, take a rational section, take its divisor. That gives you something in the Chow group. Well, for this particular power of this line bundle omega v, we have a rational section. It's the Borchardt's product. So under this isomorphism, this power of the line bundle is identified with the divisor of the Borchardt's product, which we already said was z of p, which in the complex fiber is an exact formula. There's no error term. Um, take both sides of this equality and apply the cycle class map into cohomology. So apply the cycle class map into H2. On this side, you just get the cycle class of the kudler rappaport divisor. On this side, you get the churn class of the line bundle multiplied by the power that we took. But, but if you think of H2 as Durham cohomology, how do you find an explicit closed form that represents the churn class of a line bundle? You just slap any metric on it and take the churn form of that metric. So in cohomology, this kudler rappaport divisor Z of P is just this constant term Z of C of zero times the churn form of the line bundle that we're working with. And so if you want to integrate the top exterior power of the churn form, what do you do? Well, we've got n minus one copies of it. Peel one of them off and substitute in one over C zero times the class of the kudler rappaport divisor. And then more or less by definition of the cycle class map, when you take a form, wedge it against this class and integrate, you're just integrating over the cycle itself. But then this omega v, zp is a bunch of copies of this unitary Shimura variety in one lower dimension. When you take this omega v, restrict it to zp, in, identify zp with the Shimura variety in lower dimension, you just end up with the line bundle on the Shimura variety of lower dimension. And then in other words, you get the same problem, but in one lower dimension. And so we know the answer by the induction hypothesis. And that's it. That's the proof of the, the claim one.
Okay, so then onto the arithmetic volume. Um, this is similar. So again, we have this um, arithmetic turn class map that identifies tick hat with the co-dimension one arithmetic tau group. Um, that isomorphism is the same. If you wanna know where a line bundle goes, you pick a rational section of it and you send it to the arithmetic divisor of that rational section, which just means it's supposed to be a divisor with a green function for it. The divisor is the, the divisor of the Borchardt's product, which is just this single kudler rappaport divisor. And the green function is the log of the norm of the section squared. And of course, we're identifying the kudler rappaport divisor with this unitary Shimura variety in one lower dimension up to all the error terms. And you do the same trick. You want to compute the arithmetic volume. By definition, that's you take omega v hat, you intersect it with itself a bunch of times until you get a number. You take the last copy and you replace it by the divi arithmetic divisor of the Borchardt's product. And then I have to fudge a little bit. Okay, I mean, at this point, you really have to go down and, and pick apart the definition of arithmetic intersection and arithmetic degree. But this, the divisor of the Borchardt's product has, has two components, right? I mean, there's the actual underlying divisor and there's this green function for it. And so when you compute this arithmetic volume, the two components of this allow you to break apart that arithmetic volume into two pieces, one of which only knows about the actual honest divisor up here, and the other one of which only knows about the green form. The part for the actual honest divisor, if you intersect a bunch of omega v's and then intersect it with this mv prime, you're basically just taking all of the omega v's, restricting them to mv prime, and then intersecting them there. But by definition, that's the arithmetic volume of the omega v prime computed on mv prime. It's the arithmetic volume on the smaller Shimura bar. And then the Archimedean part of this arithmetic degree is, well, you take the green function and you integrate it against, um, well, you've got n minus one copies of omega v hat, you integrate it against n minus one copies of the churn form of omega v hat. And so you're left to understand these two terms. This factor out front was by the lemma before, really just an L value. This arithmetic volume in lower dimension, we know by the induction hypothesis, there's some formula in terms of the beta one through beta n minus one. And so we're left to compute the integral of the Borchardt's form which was done in the orthogonal setting by Steve in a paper called Intervals of Borchardt's Forms. So here's what he proved. I mean, the same argument that he gave in the orthogonal world works essentially word for word in the unitary case. And here's the theorem. Um, let's go back to an arbitrary input form for the Borchardt's product. If you take the log of its absolute value and integrate it against the appropriate, the top exterior power of the churn form, you get the same integral without the Borchardt's product. And then this factor out front, which knows about the polar part of the input form, and then these B primes. So what are the B primes? Well, there's a particular weight N Eisenstein series, G S tau, and the B M S's are just its Fourier coefficients. And so we're taking the derivative of those Fourier coefficients at S equals N minus one over two. So these are derivatives of Eisenstein series coefficients. Um, oh, I gave, okay. Uh, I think since I don't have so much time, I gave, I gave the rough idea behind Steve's, uh, I'll just do it. How does Steve prove this? There's a reason I'm telling you the idea behind his proof, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, you have to go back to the construction of the Borchardt's product. Borchardt's doesn't construct psi of f directly, he first constructs what he wants to be the log of its absolute value. And he defines that harmonic function as a regularized theta lift. So you integrate over the upper half plane mod gamma zero d, you integrate this input form against the theta kernel that lifts from the upper half plane to this unitary Shimura variety. And then you take that expression for minus log of the absolute value and you plug it into this integral, swap the order of integration, and you end up basically integrating some theta series 
And the, the core of Steve's argument is that you can apply some sort of generalized version of the ziegel weil formula to this. And that's where the Eisenstein series coefficients come from. It's from ziegel weil um, so, right, so the point of including this was really, I have now fulfilled my obligation uh, to mention theta series, and I get bonus points because I even put in the ziegel weil formula. Okay. Um, that was for an arbitrary input to the Bortzard's product, but we didn't have an arbitrary one. We chose an especially simple one where the polar part just has this one little term. And then that formula simplifies to this. When you integrate the Bortzard's form against the turn form of this line bundle, it's just the integral of the turn form, but times the derivative of an Eisenstein series coefficient. If you want exact formulas, you now have to sit down and compute this Eisenstein series coefficient, which you do by computing local representation densities. And not surprisingly, the coefficient of the Eisenstein series involves an L value. And then there are some local correction factors at various bad points that you have to compute as well. But in particular, uh, we've now got a derivative of an Eisenstein series here in this integral of the Borchardt form, which is what we need to get in somehow for the final formula. Okay, so the upshot is our formula for the arithmetic volume is now uh, the arithmetic volume in something of one dimension lower, the constant term of the Eisenstein series, which is secretly one of these beta functions, and the integral of the Borchardt's form, all of which we now know how to express in terms of these various L functions. And so you put it all together, keep track of all the R terms, and you get the, you get the formula that I stated in the paper. Um, I have, what, three minutes? I'll take six because Jens talked for a while about soccer. So um, um, back when um, Brunier and Kudla and Rappaport and Yang and I computed, yikes, where'd it go? The divisors of these Borchardt's products on the integral model, we, we kind of knew that it should be possible to, to get these arithmetic volume formulas as well. Um, there's a reason one reason why um, Jan and I finally decided to sit down and work through it, which is um, um, because of applications to a conjecture of Kudla and Rappaport. So um, I've only defined the Kudla Rappaport divisors, but you can define Kudla Rappaport cycles. I don't know why I wrote this. We're just calling this one MD now. That was our um, They define cycles in all co dimensions. So in kind of a similar way, if, you, if T is now a D by D Hermitian matrix, then you can define Z of T as the moduli of tuples consisting of a CM elliptic curve, an abelian variety of higher dimension with OK action, and D maps from E into A, such that the matrix of all of their inner products is T. This will give you a, a higher co-dimension cycle on the Shimura variety. In general, uh, this, the, the, um, the co-dimension will not be D, it'll be the rank of T, uh, at least in the generic fiber and the intro model, um, you, have to, you, have to, you have to fix it. There's a way to fix it on the intro model. Um, this definition on the intro model will not give you something equidimensional, um, but there is a way to correct it to get really a class in the Chow group, which you can then endow with uh, a green form. For example, using the construction of uh, Garcia and Santran. And then you want something that's really in co-dimension D if you start with a D by D Hermitian matrix. And so you shift it into the right co-dimension just by hitting it with a bunch of copies of the inverse of this Hermitian line bundle that we've been working with. And then you can assemble all of these things into some generating series valued in the co-dimension D arithmetic Chow group. And the general expectation is that this should be the Q expansion of some sort of automorphic form on a quasi-split unitary group. In the sense that if you apply any linear functional to R, coefficient by coefficient, it will result in an automorphic form. Um, if you take the co-dimension to be the dimension of the ambient Shimura variety, so you're looking at zero cycles, then you can take the arithmetic degree and you actually get a scalar valued form. And the, the Kudler-Rappaport conjecture is that this particular scalar valued form should be the central derivative of some particular UNN Eisenstein series. I mean, the particular 
meaning, I mean, um, the Eisenstein series depends on some local data. And it's maybe not entirely clear, I think, I, I think it's not clear at all, what local data you should choose at the ramified primes. So part of the conjecture is to figure out exactly which Eisenstein series you have to put in there. Um, okay, so um, what, one of the things that motivated Jan and I to, to work out these volumes is that there was recent progress on this theorem by Charlie and Wei Zhang. They, they uh, proved a large part of this conjecture by matching up the, the, Fourier, the coefficients in this Q expansion with, the, Eisen, with the, uh, the, the coefficients of the derivatives of the Eisenstein series for those coefficients indexed by non-singular matrices. And so now you could ask, well, what about the singular ones? Can we do all the coefficients? So, well, let's look at the most singular term. The most singular term is when you just take T to be the zero matrix. And when T is the zero matrix, the definition of the constant term of this generating series just is the arithmetic volume. And so our formula for this arithmetic volume hopefully should match up with the constant term of the appropriate Eisenstein series once one figures out exactly which Eisenstein series you have to have to work with, with what local data do you put in at the bad primes in order to make this match with the constant term of the Eisenstein series. But, okay, so that's, those are the two extreme cases, the most degenerate matrix, the most non-degenerate matrices. Um, in between, so for a general T, you can always reduce the problem to T of this particular form. So an S in the upper left corner of some size that's positive definite with integral coefficients and zeros in the other blocks. Now, in the simplest case where the determinant of S is one, you can look at what this cycle is and it morally up to what will have to be some horrific correction terms at bad primes, this really is just a unitary Shimura variety of the appropriate co-dimension, but of the same type as the ambient one. And the coefficient corresponding to this matrix T should just be the Z hat of T, by definition is the Z hat of T intersected with a bunch of copies of this line bundle. But if you identify Z of T with this lower dimensional Shimura variety, you should just be computing the arithmetic volume of the analogous line bundle on this lower Shimura variety, and our formula applies to that. So for T of this form, with the determinant of S equal to one, we should be able to match up those coefficients as well. And you can probably go further. Um, since I'm already over time, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have a guess. <laughs> so just using the ideas that I have described in this talk, I would guess that you could probably try to match up all of the coefficients where T has this form. It's a positive definite S and zeros, and the determinant S is say square free. I think that's probably accessible. And I think that's how far you can get just with our methods. Then you could try to combine them with the methods of Chow and Wei and see how much further you can get there. And there, I don't really know. So that's just something to think about. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And happy birthday, Steve. Um, thank you, Ben, for this wonderful talk. Um, are there any questions? Do you have any guesses? What are the local data that you need for the Eisenstein series? Um, no. Um, I mean, part of the hope is that these calculations will, uh, you have to reverse engineer it. Now, somebody has to sit down with our calculations and reverse engineer them to cook up an Eisenstein series that matches. Nice. Um, I, I have not attempted to do that. Although I believe tomorrow we will hear a talk um, that has, that does this at least, I think in the U11 case, where there's actually the, the precise Eisenstein series. Mm -hmm. so there, is, there is growing data that should allow one to extrapolate and figure out what the exact Eisenstein series should be. But at the moment, I don't, I don't know or have a guess. Yeah, nice talk. Any, any other questions or comments? Uh, so in the proof, you carefully pick these uh, auxiliary P to be split in the CM extension. Yes. Um, but I guess in our work, uh, we only treat the inert places where the 
P is really inert, right? Um... So maybe one question is, what is the relationship when P is inert with the smallest Schumann varieties? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's, there are several reasons. Um, okay. So let's go back. Let's go back. Where did that go? Um, that's it. Okay. This Z of P and its relation to a smaller Schumann Um This is this same relation holds uh, for any P split, except that it's a different V prime but it's still just the lower smaller value of the same dimension. If you start looking at inert primes, this is probably still true, but there's a catch, which is that um, you'll have to, um, um, you'll end up with MV primes where in the moduli problem, you have non-principal polarizations. That's mm -hmm. what happens when you allow inert or ramified primes. Um, and so probably most of this still works, but what you would have to do is um, some, some brave soul would have to go back to this long paper where we compute the divisor of the Borchard's product and systematically remove the assumption that everything has a principal polarization. I mean, the principal polarization means we're only working with permission spaces that contain a self-dual lattice. Now you need to do all permission spaces. How could you have made such new kinds of bad reduction into the module? How could you have made such a serious restriction when you wrote that paper? Because, like I said, when you allow non-principal polarizations, you have an entirely different kind of bad reduction, and you have to figure out what's going on there, too. I mean, I, we probably should have worked with an arbitrary degree of polarization, but inverted the degree of the polarization, something like that, at least. But, I mean, it's just somehow you get bad fibers that are of a completely different type than the bad fibers we already had. And yeah, okay. yeah I mean, should we have done it? I don't know, maybe, yes. <laughs> Actually, I think Wade, does Wade, Wade do you have a, did you say something once about having a student who was working on this? Is Wade there? He may have vanished. Wade's watching the soccer game. Yeah. <laughs> There may or may not be a student of Wei who's attempting to do exactly that. <laughs> I don't know. I make no claim one way or the other. It's a rumor. I mean, when you write an equality that Z of P is equal and so on, I mean, what does that really mean? I mean which, which one? Like, well, you, you wrote the Z of P is equal to this P to the this. Minus, one, minus one. Right, this, yes. this equality. OK. So it means what I wrote down here, okay? So at least if you ignore the bad primes, Z of No, P but I mean, you cannot mean uh, an equality of schemes because I mean, what does this coefficient mean, for instance? I mean this, I mean that Z of P decomposes a disjoint union of three things, each of which is in a tall cover of MV prime. And when you add up the degrees of all the covers, you get that coefficient. That's what I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. But P is split here. P is split here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. So okay. this also is things with a principal polarization. Yeah. Got it. Okay. You make P inert or ramified, then I'm not sure what the analog of this is. Or even if even if you took a square free product of primes coming to one mod D, I'm not sure exactly what you would get. It would be messy. Right. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Yeah, yeah. I have uh, one question, one comment. First, uh, the question is, I mean, you, wrote, you work over the natural canonical uh, toroidal compactification here, I guess, right? That's right. But you also mentioned uh, Fritz Hermann's work, and he worked on O2N, where you don't have a uh, canonical toroidal compactification. Correct. So we, which compactifications did he use there? And it, did the result depend on the compactification? He chooses more or less an arbitrary toroidal compactification and shows that the volume does not depend on the choice. The boundary doesn't really contribute anything in the end. OK. OK. And my remark is that I, I know of a work by uh, Shohei Ma who talks about restrictions of Borchardt's products 
also to singular uh, places. Also to say, well, like, like in your case, you have that uh, Psi of F has a pole along Z of P, and you can still have some meaningful restriction of Psi of F to this polar part. It might be useful for, I don't know, simplifying something in the calculations if you try to do this. And maybe not, but just a suggestion. It might, it might work in some way. Um, there is, right. I mean, it is, yes, I know that it's possible to do such things. It never shows up here because, um, I mean, that's sort of. Yeah, you manage without it anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure that you could actually use, I mean, if you're basically talking about sort of computing, like how you compute improper intersections between these cycles, essentially. Yeah, pretty much. Um, but that never shows up here. It's, it's not, a, not an issue. Yeah, okay, I see, thanks. Thank you very much. All right. Um, if there are no other questions um, before, um, we thank uh, Ben again, as I um, would, uh, I challenged earlier this, mo this morning, uh, today's speakers to match the, the brilliancy of uh, yesterday's speakers, and so they did. And so Ben, if you allow us not only to, um, to applaud you, but all today's speakers um, at the end of the second day. I allow <laughs>